everyone. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Rogers and I welcome you to our webinar series. Our topic to for today is very timely and it's a very uh, popular topic that patients always like to discuss. We are gonna be discussing natural treatments for joint pain. And we're very excited because we have a special guest speaker today, Dr. Linda Olifson, and she's going to be talking about nutrition, supplements, and uh, strategies to decrease uh, inflammation in your body. So thank you, Dr. Olifson, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us and joining us during your lunchtime. Okay, you have seen these products. You have seen their labels where it says USDA organic, non-GMO, organic grass-fed, grain-fed, and other products like this. This is a, a butter, I believe, that says vegan, non-dairy, gluten-free, non-GMO. And it seems like there's more and more products now in the market that's coming out that's actually being more transparent in the ingredients in their products. And the list seems to be growing longer and longer. And sometimes, you know, I wonder if there's still some product left in there. Um, but my point is people are now becoming more and more conscious and aware um, of what they are putting into their body and they are seeking more and more natural options, not just in their food choices, in their overall wellness, but also in the strategies that they use to treat their conditions and treat their injuries. They're trying to stay away from pharmaceuticals, medications, and they're also trying to seek non-surgical options to uh, help their body um, heal better. So that's why I think our topic is very timely. Dr. Rogers and I are both uh, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation. We're both fellowship trained in interventional spine and interventional pain management. We also have a special training in regenerative medicine. We have decades of clinical experience in this uh, sub subspecialty and we wanna move the field forward um, with publishing uh, medical journals and uh, in textbook. Mm -hmm. We also continue to conduct clinical trials. We're wrapping up on our clinical trial for stem cell therapy for knee osteoarthritis. And we're currently uh, undergoing our uh, randomized clinical trial for using PRP and stem cell therapy for uh, the derived from bone marrow for disc degeneration. Dr. Olofsson is here to join us. She is a physician, a family practice physician. And she's also an integrative medicine physician. Dr. Olofsson, can you explain to our viewers what an integrative medicine physician is? So in integrative medicine, we primarily look for the cause for either disease and rather than just treating a person's individual symptom, we try to get to the root cause and, and treat that. And we use a lot of different modalities. So we use the best from Western medicine, but the emphasis is really on lifestyle. So we look at diet and nutrition, we look at exercise, sleep, we look at stress levels, we add supplements when appropriate. And then at the same time, if there's still symptoms or problems left, then we move to medicines. We also do a lot of um, alternative things such as yoga. We'll look at acupuncture. We look at a lot of body work. So it really uses the best from many different fields. I love that. She's, she's the perfect speaker for this um, topic. She's not only an MD, she's also an ND. She is the founder medical director of North Coast Integrative Medicine. She's also a clinical instructor uh, at UCSD, a school of medicine, family medicine. 
All right. So for today, we're going to mm-hmm. talk about natural treatments for joint pain. Dr. Rogers is going to join us and she, he's going to talk about cell-based therapies, which is also one of the most, more popular non-surgical natural treatments for joint osteoarthritis and joint pain. Then Dr. Olifson will take it away and talk about nutrition supplements to enhance joint health and anti-inflammatory strategies to improve wellness. Um, This will be about 20, 30 minutes lecture portion, and then we're going to follow with a question and answer session. So for those of you who are joining us, um, there is a question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. So at any time during the lecture, go ahead and um, type in your questions, and we will answer them at the end of the lecture. If your questions are more of a personal nature, we would prefer that you call us or you email us so that we can discuss that with you in more detail. Dr. Rogers? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ambach. So again, thanks to our folks for joining us and um, looking forward to hearing your questions towards the end. Um, So this slide is telling you that there are many different reasons why your joint may hurt. So one of the more common conditions that we see in the office, someone with knee pain, someone who has difficulty walking or maybe has swelling in their knee. Um, And as in all aspects of the practice of medicine, the most important first question that we need to answer for you is why do you hurt? It doesn't do us any good to start treating you if we really don't have a good understanding. And what we're learning uh, and integrative medicine speaks to this Mm -hmm. is that um, each condition, each symptom is very frequently uh, multifactorial, uh, many levels to unravel. And that's why integrative care is um, so helpful for treating some more complex types of um, conditions. So in the past, uh, right there at the top, you see osteoarthritis, actually osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis is extremely common. If, you, if you've been told by your doctor that you have arthritis, you are in good company. There are more than 30 million Americans who have been diagnosed with osteoarthritis. The real number is probably double that. Um, and that can involve the knee, the hip, the shoulder, and, uh, or the spine, frankly. We see a lot of arthritis in the spine as well. Um, but it's important to make sure that we're not uh, missing uh, the possibility that there may be some other process. So for example, you've heard about rheumatoid arthritis, which really is an autoimmune condition where your immune system is now attacking the, the tissues in your knee joint or, or hip joint. Um, obviously, if, it, if there's an infection, we're gonna treat you differently than if you have, uh, say, some of these other conditions. So diagnosis is job one. Next slide. And then once we have our diagnosis, there's a spectrum of treatments. And our job as your physician is to look at your individual case, look at all the things that are impacting your your arthritis, your joint pain. um, And with our knowledge of the uh, published scientific literature, combined with our experience, we can then start making recommendations as to what would be appropriate for your condition. What's going to be safe, what's going to be effective, uh, what's going to be affordable, you know, looking at all those kinds of features. On the left there, you see what we would call the standard treatments. Treatments that have been around for 30 or 40 years, such as physical therapy uh, to, you know, to improve strength of the joint, uh, to improve mobility of the joint, to maybe help with balance, uh, maybe look at other parts of the body that are uh, influencing that joint. So if your hip is stiff, that might influence pain in your knee. Uh, you know, of course, looking at the, the uh, FDA approved anti-inflammatory medications that many of are now over the counter that many people take. Uh, unfortunately, they take them chronically when really they're, they're for just acute use. You're, you're really not supposed to be taking these medications for long periods of time. Uh, Same as with the pain relievers. And then steroid injections are helpful in some patients, although they're generally uh, limited in the duration of relief that they provide patients. And they really don't cure the problem. They just sort of uh, um, inhibit the immune system temporarily in the joint. On the right there, for those patients that would not respond to standard treatments, you have surgery. In the case of someone who has severe knee arthritis, for example, with bone-on-bone degenerative changes, damage to the cartilage or to the meniscus, Oftentimes joint replacement surgery is recommended, but as you remember, I told you there are more than 30 million Americans with joint uh, diagnosed joint arthritis in the knee. There are less than 2 million joint replacements every year. So there's obviously uh, the majority of people require some other form of treatment other than surgery. So when they fail conservative standard treatment or are not yet a candidate for surgery, 
then we start looking at some of these other treatments. And so we're gonna speak a little bit to cell-based therapies, which use things like platelets or bone marrow or adipose, which is your fat tissue. All these tissues contain cells that have been shown to be helpful for healing joint injuries. And then as Dr. Olison indicated, you know, we might combine that with other forms of care that have been shown uh, to be helpful for that specific condition. Next slide. So, you know, 10, 20 years ago, Dr. Ambach and I were pretty much prescribing physical therapy or surgery or cortisone injections, but now we are farmers. And like all good farmers, you have to know your seeds, you have to know your fertilizer, you have to know your soil. You probably also need to be aware about things like sunshine and, and rain and um, nutrients for the soil, et cetera. Well, when we talk about regenerative medicine, it's very similar to being a farmer. We are planting seeds. In this case, we're using cells. And the most common cell that we use would be a platelet cell from the blood. But we might also use a cell from the bone marrow or a cell from the fat. Uh, and then these cells are stimulated to grow by growth factors, which function as fertilizers. These are molecules that stimulate cells to proliferate and turn into these various tissues, such as cartilage tissue or ligament tissue. And then of course, there's things such as scaffold, we're calling scaffold, something to support those cells so they have a nice place to grow uh, in the joint to help, help healing with that joint. And it's all really just based on the idea that the body has this intrinsic ability to heal itself. And it does that through something called orthobiologics. So orthobiologics simply refer to cells or substances derived from cells that the body uses to heal injuries. And some common examples, if you advance the slide, some common examples include, like we said, platelets, stem cells, which you've all heard about, growth factors, cytokines, proteins, and fibrin. And the list just keeps growing. Every few months, there's another paper published about some new molecule that, that has been shown to be helpful at stimulating cartilage growth or improving blood flow or inhibiting inflammation, all these very complicated things that result in um, healing of a painful joint. So next slide. So we talk about PRP and that, that was really one of the first orthobiologics that was described for orthopedic conditions. Dr. Um, Mishra, a, a orthopedic surgeon at Stanford in 2006 published a paper where he documented the results of his patients who had concentrated platelet solutions injected into their tennis elbow. So you may know that tennis elbow is a tendon, it's a painful injury to the tendon uh, in the lateral elbow. And it's usually due to tendonitis, swelling of the tendon or a tendon tear that is having difficulty healing on its own. You may know that tendons intrinsically do not have a very good blood supply. They actually have a very small number of cells in tendon tissue. And so they just intrinsically do not heal well on their own, which is why tendon tears are so common. Uh, commonly presented to us in the clinic by our patients. Mm. And so we can treat these. First of all, we diagnose them by looking at them with ultrasound or MRI. And then once we've identified the tendon, we can draw some blood from the patient and centrifuge the blood. And you see there, the blood has been centrifuged and the red blood cells, which are heavy, go to the bottom. They have iron, you know, they have hemoglobin in them. So they're heavy, they go to the bottom. The plasma is a liquid component of your blood. And then the platelets settle in the middle layer there. So we'll, com we'll combine the platelets with the plasma to create our platelet-rich plasma solution, which contains thousands of growth factors and has been shown to stimulate healing in degenerated tissues, also been shown to decrease inflammation in the joint, and perhaps um, more so than any other area in orthopedic medicine, we have now uh, what we call level one evidence. So we have numerous... Uh, randomized clinical trials, placebo-controlled trials, meta-analyses, showing again and again and again that when you properly prepare the PRP solution and inject it properly into an arthritic knee joint, uh, that it is effective and safe, more so than steroids, more so than hyaluronic acid gel. And um, why it's not yet covered by insurance is beyond me, but the data is overwhelming at this point now. We have hundreds of studies. Next slide. I just, I just wanted to remind viewers, um, I know some of you uh, follow our webinars monthly, but some of you are, are new to our webinars. All of these topics that we're presenting today are kind of lectures on their own. 
Um, we have, if you want more detailed information about all these therapies, we do have a YouTube channel that talks about all these therapies um, in detail. Uh, we want to give you a broad overview of what these natural treatment options are. And we want um, to highlight Dr. Olifson, who will talk about nutrition, uh, uh, supplements, natural treatments, as this is something that we usually get questions of a lot from our patients. And um, so if you have uh, any more questions about this, these therapies, uh, we do have a YouTube channel. We do have a, um, a Facebook that has all the information in addition to our website as well. Great. And you can, add, you can start um, typing in your questions at any time at the bottom of your screen there where it says chat or q and I believe, actually. Uh, so stem cell has now become a common household term, but I think it's important for people to realize that uh, just like PRP, where uh, it varies, there uh, I failed to mention, but there are dozens of different ways to make platelet-rich plasma solution. Uh, if you look behind me, I actually have centrifuges and a hood where we make customized versions of platelet-rich plasma. That's different than perhaps an office that has just one protocol or one centrifuge machine, and they make the same kind for everybody. The same is true for stem cells. Uh, where there are just so many different kinds. So I think most people are familiar with the concept of an embryonic stem cell. So an egg becomes fertilized by a sperm and then that egg, that fertilized egg turns into an, a ball of embryonic stem cells. Um, we do not, uh, physicians do not use embryonic stem cells as a treatment. It was primarily for research purposes and continues to be primarily for research purposes. So at one point we were all just a ball of embryonic stem cells, but then those embryonic stem cells started turning into what eventually became 37 trillion cells in your body, many of which are uh, what we would call adult stem cells. Hmm. And these adult stem cells are found in every tissue in your body. And they essentially are uh, there to help us regenerate ourselves when we become injured. And unfortunately, as we age, we use them up and so we have fewer and fewer of them, which is why it's harder to heal as we get older. But what we can do is we can uh, concentrate them so we can collect them from your fat through a simple liposuction procedure, or we can collect them from the bone marrow through a simple aspiration of bone marrow uh, from the back of the hip. And um, we can concentrate those cells um, in our clinic. Uh, I'm, I also do research on the side. So under FDA regu uh, regulations, under FDA approved clinical trials, we actually grow the cells in a lab and count them and administer them to patients. And so the point I'm making is there's many different recipes, if you will, and many different kinds of stem cells. We predominantly work with something called a mesenchymal stem cell, which has been shown to differentiate into cartilage and bone. This was first described by Dr. Arnold Kaplan. Arnie, you see there, is a friend of ours. He's a professor at Case Western in uh, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And he's sort of the godfather of the mesenchymal stem cell. He doesn't want us to call it the mesenchymal stem cell anymore because back in the 90s when he first discovered, he showed, he showed that the cell could turn into cartilage or bone or tendon. However, what we've learned is that when you inject these cells into your knee joint, or when we inject these cells into your tendon, they don't really turn into cartilage. They don't really turn into tendon. What they do instead is they secrete fertilizer. They secrete molecules that activate other cells in your joint to start to function more normally. And it's those tissues that actually grow new cartilage or grow new tendon. So it's really, he now wants us to call it a medicinal signaling cell. It's signaling, sending signals to other cells, telling them how to function properly so that you can take a degenerated joint and turn it uh, into a healthier joint. Uh, and, and again, I mentioned that we get these MSCs, these medicinal signaling cells, uh, these stem cells, if you will, from bone marrow and adipose tissue. I think it's helpful to know that these tissues contain other cells, which we're learning every day, also play a role in healing. There are molecules that are floating around in these substances that are also decreasing inflammation so it's a really a very complicated soup, if you will. <clears throat> and the reason why we feel comfortable giving them to our patients is because there is a long track record of safety. So in the case of bone marrow, uh, using bone marrow as a treatment for uh, fractures that don't heal or using them for knee arthritis, 
Uh, we have almost 30 years of data, safety data. Dr. Hernagau in Paris, France uh, has been tracking his patients for decades. So we have very good safety showing that it does not cause cancer, for example, does not um, have any other adverse events associated with the use of these biologics. The same is true with adipose tissue. We have about eight years long-term data. I personally have about six years outcome data on our patients. Um, so we feel very comfortable. We, 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 we understand these are safe. Uh, they've they're been shown to decrease inflammation uh, as well as improve uh, blood flow and, and, and even have an antimicrobial uh, effect. So they, uh, there are molecules floating around in your blood and in your bone marrow that actually fight bacteria. Dr. Rogers uh, touched upon a therapeutic exercise. Most of you have probably undergone a physical therapy. The physical therapies are important in your rehabilitation because they set you up with an exercise program that's appropriate for your condition. They also make sure that you have the proper form in performing these exercises. They are uh, performing manual therapy, which is an adjunct to um, decreasing the symptoms of your joint pain. And they can also make recommendations with regards to assistive device that can be helpful like bracing. Um, ultimately, they can uh, set you up with a home exercise program that you can carry out on your own um, to maintain the, the stability and strength of your joint. For those patients that fail land-based physical therapy, there's aquatic therapy, which is also called uh, water therapy or pool therapy. And these are uh, good for uh, patients who has a lot of pain and swelling in their joint who don't tolerate uh, physical therapy uh, that are land-based. And it just the water environment decreases the pressure and tension in the joint, and it makes them able to perform their exercises in a more gentle manner. Massage therapy, who doesn't like massage, right? I, I have yet to find one person that says no to massage therapy. And why is this so? You know, massage makes us feel better. It, it pro promotes this overall well being, it improves the sleep. They, there's data to show it, it reduces anxiety, it makes us relax. And for orthopedic conditions, it helps physical therapy with regards to their rehabilitation. And there's also uh, more and more data that shows that it reduces pain, it improves the blood flow to the, to the area, and it improves uh, flexibility in your joint. Acupuncture is a uh, traditional uh, Chinese medicine that involves putting small uh, needles into acupressure points in your body. There has been data that shows that the the needles being put in this specific acupressure points it stimulates um, our central nervous system or the, uh, the electric current basically that's um, uh, controlling our body. The, just the act of putting these needles into these pressure points has been shown to have positive effects and creates a, a what we call an autonomic uh, reflex that has positive effects on our immune system, our cardiovascular system, and our um, gastrointestinal system. More and more data also have shown that it modulates our uh, neurotransmitters or these chemical messengers in our body uh, that are involved in pain trans transmission and it decreases um, pain signals in our body. There's also meta-analysis uh, data that shows that in patients with osteoarthritis, it does improve uh, joint pain and it improves short-term and long-term physical function. Yoga is an, uh, an ancient Indian practice that involves deep breathing, meditation, and body postures. And there is literature that shows that it's a good adjunct in the management of joint osteoarthritis by reducing pain, increasing function. It also helps with your strength and your balance and gait. Uh, there has been psychological benefits also that has been shown uh, in published literature with yoga therapy by reducing blood pressure, heart rate, and anxiety. And then there's our ever dependable modalities. You know, they're easily accessible. We've got our ice packs uh, that reduce inflammation, swelling, and pain. And we have our heating packs that helps relieve muscle and joint stiffness. They're very simple, but they can decrease the use of pain medications because they are effective in most cases to decrease pain and swelling in your joints. 
Weight loss is very important. You know, being overweight is a uh, significant risk factor in developing joint pain and joint osteoarthritis. That increased weight um, that you have puts extra load and tension to your joints that are already swollen and stiff, and it just makes it more painful. It has been said that for every step that you take, that's 2.5 times of your body weight that your knee carries. So if you lose 10 pounds, for example, that's 25 pounds that is unloaded off your knee per one step. So if you're taking a thousand steps a day, that's 25,000 pounds that you just unloaded on your knee just for that one day alone. So think about that. Um, we cannot overemphasize the importance of weight loss, maintaining a health weight by regu maintaining regular physical activity and combine that with a balanced diet. And that will segue to uh, Dr. Olofsson, who will talk about uh, nutrition strategies to reduce inflammation and in supplements. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I really appreciate being able to be here today and talk to you a little bit about natural strategies to reduce inflammation. I think my goal for today is to give you some very practical information, hopefully a few little pearls so that you really feel motivated and empowered to make some dietary and nutritional changes. So it is very well established that inflammation is at the core of most chronic disease. So that does, that includes arthritis, but that also includes coronary artery disease, it includes Alzheimer's and cancer. And our standard American diet tends to be very high in animal protein and processed foods, which increase the inflammatory burden. So it really makes sense that if we can make modifications in our diet, we can decrease inflammation. So you can go to the first slide. So I'm gonna encourage people to not think of the anti-inflammatory diet as a diet, but really as a eating plan that is based in scientific knowledge and data. So we'll go through some general principles and then we'll break it down into each of the macronutrients so I can give you a, a little bit um, more specific information. So primarily the focus of an anti-inflammatory diet is on whole grains, fruits and vegetables. We recommend lean protein and in particular uh, vegetable proteins, healthy fats like olive oils, spices. Uh, we do aim for variety. Everybody's heard about eating the rainbow. It makes a difference. You want to include as much fresh food as possible and avoid processed food, fast food, and, and sugar. And I would argue that following this not only decreases inflammation, but it, you'll find an increase in energy, an increase in mental clarity, and you will also find that you have the, you're really getting the full spectrum of vitamins, minerals, fiber, essential fatty acids, and phytonutrients. Okay, so let's look very specifically at carbohydrates. So we all know you wanna avoid refined and processed carbohydrates, which means you have to reduce your consumption of foods that are made with white flour and sugar. So this does include white rice, it includes white bread, um, it includes pastries, most packaged snacks, most cereals. And the reason is that these are really very empty calories they lead to spikes in blood sugar, which increases insulin, which ultimately increases inflammation. We want to eat more whole grains, such as brown rice and bulgar wheat. And I want to just review for you all so you're really clear on what the difference is between a whole grain and a refined grain. So a, a whole grain actually has three components. It's surrounded by a fiber rich uh, bran. And then there's some the middle section that's called the endosperm and that is primarily carbohydrates with a little bit of protein. And then there is a small germ in the center and that's a very micronutrient rich core. 
So when they refine carbohydrates, they actually, they remove the bran and they remove the germ. So all you're left with is that middle um, endosperm, which is almost all car carbohydrates, almost completely void of fiber and nutrients. So that's why it's really important to choose a whole grain. If you wanna eat more beans, squashes, sweet potatoes. And again, the reason is similar that these foods tend to have a lower glycemic index. They contain more fiber. They're digested much more slowly. So you get that slower increase in uh, blood sugar and insulin. The same thing goes for pasta. So while we recommend pasta really in small amounts, very much in moderation. If you do cook your pasta al dente, it's much better for you. Again, digestion is much slower, slower release of blood sugar, which leads to lower insulin. You recommend that you avoid high fructose corn syrup at all costs. This is basically just a sweetener that's made from corn syrup and it is a driver for inflammation. Okay, next slide. So when we talk about fats, um, olive oil is considered a healthy fat. It's our principal fat, the main fat that we use with cooking. It's a mono unsaturated fatty acid. You can see I've listed a couple of other oils that are ex um, acceptable. They are all organic and they're expeller pressed. Now, the reason the other oils are not recommended, so just what we would call a regular safflower or sunflower oils, is those oils are actually extracted by using a solvent, and it's usually hexane. And in that process, you do end up with a small amount of those solvents in the fats. So anything that's organic is, it's almost an oxymoron, is expeller pressed. And that is actually just a physical pressing of the grain. You do wanna avoid margarine and vegetable shortening. And that's because those are just basically trans fatty acids. So another name for trans fatty acids is that partially hydrogenated oils, you wanna avoid them completely. And again, just so you're clear, this is an industrial process that actually adds hydrogen to a liquid vegetable oil. And this is what makes it more solid and more stable. We want to avoid that. Okay, next slide. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Rogers, feel free to um, look at the questions and um, ask any related question from the audience because I can't, can't see the questions right now. Actually, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I know, me too. This sounds like a really tasty meal. <laughs> so in terms of uh, fat and omega-3 fatty acids, generally salmon is one of the best types. Preferable is fresh or frozen wild or canned sockeye. You can do sardines, herring, and black cod. Additional fats come from nuts, seeds, and avocado. I, I do wanna make a point here, a couple of points, cause I tend to get a lot of questions on this. So omega-3 fatty acids are called essential fatty acids. And that's because we can't manufacture them. You either have to be eating the fat or you need to take it as a supplement. So if you're not eating oily fish at least twice a week, I do recommend a really high quality marine-based fish oil. So that has EPA and DHA in it. And just anticipating a question, this is different than say flaxseed oil. So flaxseed is also an omega-3. It's a good omega-3, it's plant-based. And being that it's plant-based, its primary um, fatty acid is alpha linoleic acid. So very different, has different benefits than the EPA and the DHA. And those are the two things that you really need to decrease inflammation. And just a comment too, there are uh, vegetarian sources of that. It's just that you tend to have to take a lot more. Is there, Dr. Olison, is there a minimal dosage of EPA or DHA that you uh, would recommend? Because I know it varies widely from product it, to product. It, it does. So in general, 
So I do, everybody is different and they have their own medical history. In general, I recommend 2000 milligrams of the EPA and DHA combined. So if you were to look at the bottle on the back, it usually says total marine oils. It's not that number. That number is always higher. What you wanna look at is where it says EPA and then it will say 300, DHA 500. So it's the total. So that would give you 800. So you know you need at least two of those. Um, we use different amounts, of course, varying on, on different um, medical issues, but 2000 uh, of a really high quality fish oil is a good place to start. Okay, next. Uh, in terms of protein, we do try to get people to think differently about protein, definitely more vegetable protein, especially beans, soybeans, and lentils. And again, just anticipating questions, especially about soy. So when I talk about soybeans, I'm talking about either fermented soy. So that would be things like miso and tempa, or it would be a whole soy product, which would be something like edamame um, and tofu. These are really good for you. What we don't recommend is processed soy. So like a soy cheese or a soy burger, because they've gone through a lot of processing, but soy protein has a lot of benefits, both in terms of protein, um, fiber, it's great for hormone metabolism. Again, you wanna decrease animal protein in general. It doesn't say eliminate, just decrease. Include fish if you can two times a week. Poultry is good, but generally in low to moderate amounts. Uh, you wanna minimize cow's dairy. And again, it's the, the protein casein, which has been linked. Now studies are mixed to inflammation. I generally encourage people to consider or think more about goat cheese or sheep, such as a feta or a manchego, both are much uh, less inflammatory. And then of course, there's certain medical conditions when you tend to wanna have less protein, if you have allergies, liver or kidney problems. Okay, next. So fiber, you know, basically, 35 grams a day or more is what our goal is. And again, you can achieve that by consuming fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, soy, and whole grains. Again, this is in general. I like to recommend that people consider one to two pieces of fruit per day. And that emphasis would actually be on berries, apples, pears. They tend to be high in fiber, low glycemic index. And I recommend at least five to nine servings of vegetables a day. To give you a frame of reference in Japan, that recommendation is 15 to 18 servings a day. And just so it's clear too, a serving size is considered a half a cup, unless it's say the lettuce in your salad, and that would be a full cup. So sometimes people are actually eating a little bit more um, than they think when it's really just a half a cup. Okay, I'm going to the next. So phytonutrients. So I want to talk a little bit about antioxidants. So vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene and the carotenoid. So that's also alpha carotene and lutein, zinc, copper, selenium, polyphenols. These are really all excellent antioxidants. They help reduce inflammation by nullifying free radicals. Okay. Next. So again, it's eating a wide variety of fruits and vegetables. You want to choose organic whenever possible. And I would say, you know, the primary reason for that is organic foods tend to be very low in pesticides or have no pesticides. The data on whether they have more nutrients has been, has been mixed but I do think that's a good choice. You wanna eat cruciferous vegetables regularly. I generally recommend a serving a day. And a cruciferous vegetable comes from that broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprout family. A lot of people don't know that arugula 
is actually cruciferous. So you can throw a handful of arugula on a salad and you've got your servings for, uh, for the day. And again, including fermented or whole soy, soy products is important. Okay, next. Um, you wanna uh, drink tea. That doesn't mean you don't wanna drink coffee because I think there's a lot of benefits of coffee, but tea in particular is high in polyphenols, so potent antioxidants. Um, actually green tea and black tea are, have the highest concentration of polyphenols. That's the same reason why dark chocolate and red wine are included in an anti-inflammatory diet is they're also both high in polyphenols. You can see the dark chocolate. Of course, it's recommended an ounce a day, which is usually just a square. So it's a small amount, but it does have benefit. And if you drink red wine is pref preferable. And the primary polyphenol in red wine is resveratrol, which most people have heard of that can really be beneficial in terms of inflammation. This is slide is just making me and Dr. Rogers very happy. <laughs> you I'm know, you see yeah, right yeah, now is doing yeah. lots of studies on dark chocolate in terms of its antioxidant potential and its role in cardiovascular health. So when eaten in moderation, it really can be good for you. Okay, so as you can, there, the supplements I've listed, you probably are looking at it and thinking, oh, there's a lot, a lot of things missing. What about glucosamine? What about chondroitin, MSM? And I really wanted to just talk about supplements that decrease the inflammatory burden. And um, I'm gonna talk about everything except, I wanted to list res resveratrol and alpha lipoic acid. We're not gonna talk about those. They tend to reduce inflammation in more specific circumstances, typically with patients that have insulin resistance. So I wanted you to have the information. Omega-3 fatty acids we've already discussed. So we can go to our first one, which is curcumin. So, it is primarily uh, known as a spice, and it is the primary compound in curry powder. It's the active component that's found in turmeric. Um, I would say curcumin is probably one of the most extensively studied supplements, and it really does. It has potent anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and anti-cancer properties. Um, multiple studies have shown that it can decrease pain and inflammation associated with both osteoarthritis, so a degenerative arth arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis, so more inflammatory. And I think the next point is also um, important is it helps maintain healthy joints. So um, that's a good point. There's lots of other potential benefits of curcumin, including there's some some research on it being uh, beneficial in terms of cancer because it reduces angiogenesis, which is the development of blood cells that cause metastasis. We definitely know it protects us from free radicals. It crosses the blood brain barrier. Um, and there's some studies with curcumin and omega-3s being beneficial for Alzheimer's. So really a great supplement. Okay, next slide. So this is important. You want to look for an extract that has at least 95% curcuminoids, again, free from additives, fillers. It is not well absorbed unless it has black pepper or piperine. So make sure you look for that on the bottle. Now, there are some very high quality brands now that are wrapping their curcumin in a lipid or like a little fatty bubble. So it might have a phospholipid coat and that also enhances absorption is good. A typical starting dose would be 500 milligrams, generally twice a day. And you can see a couple of contraindications. You don't wanna use it if you have gallstones, bile duct dysfunction. Pregnancy and nursing pretty much for most supplements and herbs are not recommended. And it's just because we don't have the research. So we're not really clear if they're safe. Okay, so Boswellia. Um, is an anti-inflammatory herb. It's also known as Indian frankincense. Um, it's been used extensively in Ayurvedic medicine. It's used to treat inflammation, arthritis, pain, fever, and heart disease. You can see that it works by inhibiting this pro-inflammatory um, enzyme. I would also comment too that 
curcumin and boswellia seem to work very synergistically. And I would also include ginger. So if somebody is not getting really good relief from just curcumin, I often encourage them to find a product that has all three of those anti-inflammatory herbs together. They tend to work very well. Okay. Again, you Dr. Olison, sorry to interrupt. We had a question from someone in the audience asking about whether or not curcumin needs to be heated. Have you heard anything about whether or not it has to be heated? It does not need to be heated. And, and again, you can use curcumin also as a spice, but in terms of, and we encourage people to, but in terms of really getting a medicinal response, it's probably better to use it as a supplement. One, you can see the exact amount, but you, it's hard to get the amount that you need from just using it as a spice, but no, the, it does not need to be heated. And again, you can see the Boswellia, it imp improves pain and mobility. And again, both in the degenerative and inflammatory arthritis. And as I mentioned already, it's similar to turmeric and it may have a synergistic effect. Okay, you can see again, tablet or capsule. One thing about Boswellia is it does tend to work a little bit more quickly than other supplements. A lot of times herbs, we always tell people, oh, you know, give it four to six weeks. I would say within a week or, or so, Boswellia is often effective. Here are some general dosing guidelines. Um, again, don't take it with pregnancy, with lactation, and there are several other medications. And the other thing I would comment on is there is some information now that Boswellia may interfere with cholesterol lowering medications. Now it's some say that it actually will increase the level. So if anybody is taking a medication for cholesterol, I just encourage you to follow your lipids if you're gonna take Boswellia. So ginger, another herb that's great for inflammation. It's related to turmeric and cardamom. Most people know ginger for its digestive effects, so it has a lot of anti-nausea and anti-vomiting effects, especially for motion sickness, for pregnancy, and even post-operatively, but it has been used in traditional medicine for a long time for decreasing pain and inflammation, and again, it has both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Again, you can use it fresh ground or in a capsule form. Um, in, in the fresh form, you can make it as a, as a tea, but again, I have found that to be most beneficial more for the digestive issues as opposed to joint, joint issues. Ginger definitely can interfere with blood clotting, so you have to be careful if you're taking blood thinners. You can also, Boswellia, omega-3s, all of these, you have to be careful if you're taking a, a blood thinner. So collagen peptides. So collagen is the primary protein that's responsible for healthy joints and skin. And a collagen peptide is actually just a small piece of collagen that uh, they're water soluble and very highly bioavailable. And so you produce collagen naturally just by combining certain amino acids, proline that are found in food. But like most things, just as we get older, our ability to efficiently produce collagen just declines. Um, it definitely supports joint mobility and function. It's a really nice building block for connective tissue. We'll go to the next. The biggest thing is really high safety and tolerability. So it comes as a powder. You can see five to 10 grams is, is the typical amount you mix with water. Um, usually just once a day, it does not interfere with blood thinners. So that's one big difference. You don't have any of the negative effects that you can get with anti-inflammatories, but again, no pregnancy or lactation. Um, Dr. Olison, with regards to uh, the supplements effect on blood thinners, how long do you recommend uh, to stop the supplements before any uh, procedure or before um, any um, activity that we so think- That is a great question. And we recommend five full days. And, and that can include mild things like a dental procedure, um, any type of, of surgery, but five days. Thank you. 
So just to summarize everything. So again, the primary thing, your diet really needs to just think fresh foods, whole foods, unprocessed, high quality protein, colorful fruits and vegetables. And if I may, let me tell you just about this one study that I found so interesting. So they had two groups of people and in each of the groups, they all ate uh, nine servings a day of fruits and vegetables. However, in one group, they ate from the same five. So, you know, they had their tomatoes, the cucumber, their carrots. And in the other group, they really ate from the rainbow. And when they looked at markers for inflammation, the group that ate the rainbow, their CRP, all of their markers for inflammation were really much lower. So eating that rainbow is really important, makes a difference for inflammation. So fiber rich grains, legumes, chickpeas, beans, lentils, healthy fats, nuts and seeds, fresh herbs as those listed here. And the last page, I do recommend actually a daily multivitamin and minerals uh, for people. You know, even if you have a great diet, it just fills in the gaps. And a lot of this is just a reflection of the poor nutrient quality of our soil here. So even if you have a great diet, many people are still lacking in minerals in particular. So I think, again, a good vitamin does that. Your um, vitamin should not have iron unless you're a menstruating female. We have more problems with iron overload. I do recommend pretty much that everyone take a high quality omega-3, you can say 2000 here milligrams per day. And all the other supplements are really individualized to somebody's uh, symptoms and how they're responding to above. So thank you very much. Great, really great summary tackling probably one of the most complicated topics in all of medicine something that affects every one of us. Um, each of us have our own unique health care, health needs, right? We have our own medical conditions, our own genetic biases. Absolutely. We have our own food preferences, um, but a really great summary of really the key concepts that have been elucidated over this past several decades of research. Our audience actually has several very specific questions about certain products. I'm going to ask you about some of these. Um, as you know, high cholesterol is an issue. Um, you know, you can minimize the amount of dietary cholesterol. Some people unfortunately have some genetic issues that maybe make them synthesize cholesterol more than others. There's some questions here about red, red yeast rice, uh, CoQ10 uh, versus statins, pros and cons of statins, those kinds of questions. Okay, so I'm gonna answer this a little bit generically with the same caveat that Dr. Rogers indicated that everybody's different and there is clearly not a one size fits all. So I'm gonna say um, red yeast rice has actually fallen out of favor over the last couple of years. And again, the reason being that red yeast rice basically is it is a natural statin. It's like the oldest statin that we have, Mevacor. And it, it, the, the amount per supplement really varies. So if I'm going to address cholesterol from a lifestyle, you know, diet, nutrition, exercise supplements, I tend to start with bergamot. And there's, I, I don't, we probably don't have the time to go. So I love bergamot. If somebody has blood sugar issues, I often use berberine. I always use omega-3s and I always use CoQ10. And actually CoQ10 is a potent antioxidant, but it's also, it's a mitochondrial energizer and it's essential for cellular or mitochondrial energy. So I actually recommend CoQ10 for anybody over the age of 50. I recommend it at a dose of 100 milligrams per day. 
for anybody that happens to be taking red yeast rice because it ha it acts like a statin, it does deplete CoQ10. So mm -hmm. if you take red yeast rice, you need to take CoQ10 along with it. And then moving to statins. So I am not anti-statin at all. I tend not to start there. Again, I tend to start with lifestyle and, and supplements, but there are people that despite all of our efforts, we do not achieve the recommended goal. And I wanna make that clear too. Our goal when we use supplements is the same as using medications. Meaning if somebody is seeing me for rheumatoid arthritis and I'm using something natural, my goal is to prevent abling, crippling arthritis. And if I can't do that with supplements, they need then to consider medications. So this is the beauty of taking the best from both. And I feel the same way about cholesterol. If we're unable to achieve our goal, I will move to a statin, though I typically use it a little differently than most traditional physicians. I actually have found that I can achieve really great results using a statin twice a week rather than every day. And in this regard, we tend to minimize any potential side effects um, and we still get a great result. So there's lots of things and I would only end by saying if I have somebody, let's say they're not reaching their goal, um, in terms of cholesterol reduction, and they're very reluctant or hesitant to use a statin, though I think it might be indicated, then I usually suggest, well, let's look at a coronary calcium score. Do they have any calcified plaque? Let's look at an advanced lipoprotein analysis. There's things that you can do to determine how aggressive you need to be. And speaking of calcium, we have another question and um, it's, it's becoming obvious that we could probably talk for the next 37 I know. minutes about nutrition. And um, there's so much information about nutrition out in the media and yet so little of it is helpful for a given individual, which is why it underscores the importance of you know, meeting with someone like you, Dr. Olison, who can really you know, customize uh, what's important and prioritize what's important for a given person. But your general comments are really helpful here. Um, another common thing we hear about is calcium, right? We know that uh, particularly in women, postmenopausal women, uh, osteoporosis is an issue. Uh, you can have too much calcium, right? You can have uh, calcification of your blood vessels, but you can also have inadequate mineralization of your bone. So some people are asking, well, um, we know that milk is a source of calcium because they fortify the milk. But if I'm drinking almond milk, you know, or some other, some other product, non, non-fat organic yogurt. Is that a good calcium source? What are, what are some general guidelines you can give about? Okay. So that's a, that's a, that's a big question. I know. So, um, I do not recommend milk for dairy, cow's dairy milk for anybody over the age of two, basically. I don't think we need it. We have so many other options from food sources where we can get calcium. So people don't realize almonds, green leafy vegetables, salmon, seeds. There are so many non-dairy sources of calcium. Now, I do think that a low fat yogurt falls under the umbrella of an anti-inflammatory diet. So I think uh, yogurt can be a good source of calcium. In general, most people do get adequate calcium from their diet, even if they're not um, using cow's dairy. I do recommend a calcium supplement for women, not men, over that are postmenopausal. I typically like calcium citrate because it is well absorbed, or I like a calcium hydroxy apatate, which is a kind of a full bone calcium. So you get a lot of different nutrients. Um, the, the, the studies on calcium where they only looked at calcium as, but not part of a whole comprehensive plan is where they saw some problems with calcification in the arteries. So calcium should really be taken for bone health as part of a comprehensive bone health 
that includes not just calcium, but vitamin D and K2. So vitamin D is what increases the absorption of calcium from our guts. And K2, I think has now become the missing link between cardiovascular and bone health. K2 ensures that calcium goes to the bones and not to the cardiovascular system. So I rarely prescribe calcium alone. It should be calcium, vitamin D3 plus K2. Perfect. Thank you Thank for you. that. Dr. We only have a minute or two left. Do we have time for another question, Dr. Umbach? Yeah, so uh, there, is there any uh, supplement or um, nutritional um, guide that you can, that, that you know of, or any study that supports um, any effects on stem cell therapy release or platelet uh, uh, release, growth factor release, anything at all that relates to overall uh, health of uh, stem cells and platelets? I, that I do not know. I That's do. an interesting question. I know the answer. Let me get not, back to you. Sorry, the answer is um, exercise. Oh. So there are a number of studies that show that, uh, and we use this with our patients when we do PRP. Right. Uh, somebody asked here a question about PRP coming out of Panama. Uh, the PRP doesn't come out of Panama. It comes out of your blood vessel. And uh, and so as long as the doctor is processing the PRP appropriately, um, we're going to get a good PRP sample. We can augment the number of platelets with exercise. So there's studies that show that if you walk or run on a treadmill, uh, either walk uh, at, a, at a brisk pace or for, for about 20 minutes or run at a high intensity for about 10 minutes, we can raise your platelet count by about 20 to 25%. So that might give it an S temporary, it's a temporary effect. So, you know, we often have our patients exercise if they can uh, right before we draw their blood for their PRP. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it also has been shown to mobilize uh, the MSC, the mesenchymal stem cell that I talked about. Uh, some uh, grad students uh, were guinea pigs for this study. They had their blood drawn. There were no MSCs floating around in their blood. They made them then run on a treadmill for 20 minutes, drew their blood again, a bunch of MSCs swimming around in the blood. So we do know that exercise uh, can mobilize platelets and stem cells into the bloodstream. Uh, and then finally, there's some good evidence for just weight loss or uh, time-restricted eating has been shown to increase uh, stem cell counts. And I'm blanking on what they were measuring, if they were measuring it in the blood or some other tissue, but um, you can research, you can look into that. There's some evidence for that as well. Um, the other question that uh, maybe we should address um, uh, let's see. Oh, I lost it now. I'm so sorry. Oh, some patients have had their gallbladder removed and you talked about how certain um, herbs or spices might uh, influence uh, gallbladder health. Any general comments about people who've had a cholecystectomy? Yeah. So actually um, those patients can use the curcumin. It was for more for people that actually have active gallbladder problems. The curcumin can actually um, induce gallbladder attacks. If you don't have the gallbladder, you don't have to worry about it. Got it. Dr. Allison, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you so much learned, for having me. We learned a really lot. Great. Yeah, we learned a lot today. I'm sure our, our viewers learned a lot as well. There's a lot of uh, very specific questions here. And if you want to follow up with Dr. Allison, she can um, attend to you one-on-one -on -one and give you a comprehensive evaluation and uh, a treatment option for you. Um, but thank you everyone for joining us. You know, we do this every, every month. Um, every first Wednesday, we also have an Ask the Doc series where Dr. Rogers and I make ourselves available for 30 minutes to answer any questions that you might have regarding orthopedic conditions and regenerative medicine. Maybe we should invite Dr. Olison to do a nutritional <laughs> supplement of the Docs session. Um, but thank you so much. This has been a really great lecture. Thank you, Dr. Olofsson, for joining us. And thank, thank you, you. Everyone for joining. Thank you.